There were times before the unlimited Metro card came around when I would walk 30 blocks to avoid spending 225 on the subway. The unlimited Metro card was a godsend to me. Welcome to the Best New Ideas in Money, a podcast from MarketWatch. I'm Stephanie Kelton. I'm an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. And I'm Charles Passy, a reporter at MarketWatch. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. Everyone loves a bargain. There's something satisfying about getting a good deal, especially if you've worked at landing it. This week, we're talking about a whole culture that surrounds frugality, or cheapism, as I and some others like to call it. So what should we make of this boom in budget living? And how is a new crop of apps bringing it back in style? You said cheapism. It's also been called spinthriftism. There's a lot of different names that that come up, but they're all getting at kind of the same thing. And we want to dig deeper and say, well, maybe they're different sort of driving forces for frugality. Ronald Goldsmith is a retired professor of marketing at Florida State University and a consumer psychologist. His research investigates what impulses lead people to be thrifty. There's a concept called consumer independence, which means to what extent are you independent of the opinions of others? How how important are other people to you in your self-concept and the way you live? Self-control is a characteristic that's been looked at, that frugal people have more self-control than non-frugal people. We've kind of cycled through many different periods in our history where thrift was valorized. Lauren Weber is a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. She's also the author of In Cheap We Trust, the story of a misunderstood American virtue. It's a cultural history of penny pinching in America. It was considered a heroic virtue, sometimes a virtue that was required to build a new nation. You know, if you want to go all the way back to Ben Franklin and even earlier than that. At times, patriotism meant saving, and at other times, it meant spending. The post-war era was a period when Americans were really encouraged to spend. One reason for that was because what pulled the United States out of the Depression was largely war spending. This was also a time when credit cards became increasingly available, so you know you were encouraged to borrow on credit. But even in heated periods of buying and borrowing, there was always a group that went against the grain. At every point in American history, there were countercultural movements, you know, so at the same time that there was this exhortation to keep spending, there were always, you know, countercultural movements like the hippies in the, you know, 1960s that were considered to be anti materialistic and you can live with very little. So, what was really fascinating to me in, in doing the research was seeing there were always, you know, reactions to whatever was the dominant narrative around consumption, spending, and saving. A very striking moment in this history, of course, was right after 9 11 when there was this real push to get people to not stop spending, you know, but to do the opposite, keep spending to keep the economy moving. Weber's book came out in 2009, when suddenly lots of people were feeling the economic pinch. I would say the Great Recession really did spark a new interest in living cheaply, living frugally. This was around the time when freegans, who are people who, you know, basically try to live spending as little money as possible, ideally no money, you, you know, dumpster dive for your food and for your furniture, you walk or take or bike instead of having a car or taking the subway and buses. I think it did lead a lot of people to question the idea of living on credit, you know, at, I think around the time of the Great Recession, um, you know, the the amount of debt that Americans were in was at a record high. So, you know, a lot of people got much more interested in paying off your debt or not buying more house than you could afford. Of course, for some, being cheap isn't a choice. It's a necessity. Many people use coupons and every bit of spare change just to get by in day-to-day life. But for others who have the luxury, Weber says cheapness can become a game or a kind of hobby. I often think of it as a challenge. At the end of the day, I would sometimes take a little inventory. How much money did I spend? What did I spend money on? Apps and social media have made this game much more widely accessible. There were newsletters, you know, going back 
decades, probably to the 70s or 80s on how to save money. So I think that idea has been around for a while. But of course, the internet makes this so much easier because now you have websites devoted to this. You have people kind of swapping tips or sharing notes, kind of competing in a way. The way Ronald Goldsmith sees it, there's a new generation adopting these cheapest behaviors. It's been around for a long time, but was facing these tremendous social forces, you know, pushing the materialistic culture, and it wasn't cool to do it. It's, it's just like a change in mindset. If they're exposed to more examples, which I think they are, that will have a tendency to encourage people to try these new things, and, and some will adopt them. The culture has a huge pervasive influence on people's behavior. As the, let's call it the more frugal culture, began to get more publicity and more exposure, particularly with uh, younger people, and then kind of a general disillusionment with, with marketing because people have become very cynical about marketing. It's made a little resurgence. Goldsmith says that influence can easily come from the messages your family sends you as a child. It's a combination of nature and nurture. My family grew up during the Depression, and they passed on a lot of those behaviors to me. I mean, I didn't realize it at the time as I reflect. I think, oh yeah, that's what the, that's why it happened. I don't pride myself, but it is kind of my natural way. I'm a recycler, a reuser, a repairer. I look for the cheapest gas using Gas Buddy. It does reflect my own personal behavior. For Lauren Weber, starting her own family undid some of her thrifty habits. For myself, I mean, honestly, I would say I have really moderated over time, partly because I have a kid and you, once you have a kid, you're often doing things just for convenience. Before I had a child, I, you know, I would just go out of my way. It didn't matter how long I had to walk to avoid taking the subway or, you know, if I had to go without food for a while because I wanted to wait till I got home and ate the leftovers in my kitchen. When you have a kid, you know when they're hungry or like really thirsty, it just makes more sense to like buy a bottle of water at the corner deli as much as it kills me. Yeah, I've definitely moderated, but I mean, there were times before the unlimited metro card came around when i would walk 30 blocks to avoid spending 225 on the subway or whatever it was then the unlimited metro card was a godsend to me because you know now i have that and i don't have to weigh that i don't have to weigh each decision carefully about am i going to walk or am i going to take the subway or the bus coming up we'll get right to the point with one of the preeminent celebrities of cheapism and discover some apps to help you save money that's after the break Welcome back to the Best New Ideas in Money. Before the break, we talked about how American culture has swung from lean to lavish through our history, and how Gen Z's pendulum seems to be swinging back toward the cheap side. Our next guest is an expert in making your money work for you. One day I decided to, to kind of start a blog to share my thoughts on points, because at the time I wasn't making a lot of money being an HR, but I was able to travel all around the world in first class. Brian Kelly, better known as the points guy, started his career in HR at a finance company. His hobby, collecting airline points and deploying sophisticated strategies to max them out, built him something of a travel empire. And that was when my life changed dramatically. I was able to create enough income to leave Morgan Stanley, which shocked my parents and all of my friends. They thought I was a lunatic to do blogging as a career, but it was the best decision I've ever made. Kelly discovered a lot of other people shared his obsession. I discovered this online community called Flyer Talk of really smart people all around the world who were sharing incredibly useful information on how to get the most out of loyalty programs. And I immediately fell into that community. And, you know, six years later, I ended up basically translating that community via a blog. He's noticed that younger people seem interested in following in his footsteps. We're seeing an even another generational shift with the pandemic where people are feeling emboldened as ever to you know, break away from the notion that you need to work in corporate America your whole life. 
I think that trend is going to continue, especially with, you know, Gen Z who's grown up on the internet, who's grown up trusting other people's advice and sharing and really wanting to not live the same life as even millennials or, you know, their parents, Gen Xers. So it's a really interesting shift, but I think it's a good shift because consumers are as savvy as ever and you can win massively, you know, especially in loyalty and credit cards. That's my expertise, but in so many other ways, having more boldness to, to make big life decisions. According to Kelly, you don't have to invest a lot of time or energy to benefit from his credit card point strategies. He says, keep applying for new cards and charge the minimum amount to get the maximum sign up points, then use them for travel and upgrades. You don't have to go to extremes to extract huge value. You know, simply getting a single credit card can get you a business class ticket to Europe, for example. Kelly explains that as long as you pay your credit card bill in full and on time, his points game can not only get you free trips, it might even improve your credit score. The more credit you have available and the longer you have it, the higher your credit rating. So not only do you rake in amazing points that save you thousands of dollars on trips, but you actually get lower interest on your mortgage down the line because your FICO score is higher. So this game is a game that can be won on multiple levels. And that's why so many Americans are obsessed with it, because it's a hobby that also makes your financial life better. Whereas in other hobbies, you spend money in it, you know, you might get into debt. But if you play the points game right, you become more financially secure and are able to travel way outside of the means that someone would normally be able to afford. So I personally have 25 different credit cards and my credit score is near perfect. I don't recommend everyone right now going out and getting 25 cards. I've, I've done this over the last 15 to 20 years and you take a measured approach. You never want to bite off more than you can chew. Speaking of chewing, I recently came across a new money saving app that helped inspire this episode. Too Good To Go finds gourmet leftovers for a fraction of the price you'd normally pay. That might sound strange at first, but here's how it works. Food businesses operate knowing that they're going to serve the last customer just as well as the first customer of the day. And in order to do that, they need to have a little bit of surplus left over. Claire Oliverson is Too Good To Go's U.S. Head of Marketing. So when you get a surprise bag, you should expect to get, you know, either a full meal, a bunch of ingredients. So think about your local pizza shop. If they make 50 pies per day, you know, sometimes they sell 42, sometimes they sell 48, but they're always going to have a little bit of buffer. Too Good To Go says their model benefits its customers, vendors, and the environment. It's a B Corporation, which means it has a private certification that says it lives up to certain social and environmental standards. Companies like Seventh Generation, Patagonia, and Ben & Jerry's are also B Corporations. We're really thinking about how can we create a win-win-win for everyone. It's you know a win for the consumers, you get great food for a third of the price, and we make sure that it's a win for these businesses as well. Too Good To Go takes a flat fee, and they get uh, the remaining revenue. It's just a really interesting trend that I think is taking off for a number of reasons. And, you know, one of them could be never paying retail. A lot of the time these days, I'll go and I'll get my clothing from a really cool boutique thrift shop as opposed to buying it new. Am I no longer paying full retail? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not. Um, but I also feel like I'm getting something different and kind of exciting. And I think Too Good To Go is similar to that. It's kind of a fun way to shop that I do agree is a little bit different than the norm. I think that it's no longer taboo to say, hey, you know, I got a great deal on this. You know, I want to show up as a responsible kind of consumer and person in the world. World. You know, one path, I guess, is to make an insane amount of money. But quite frankly, I don't think that's going to happen for most of us. The other path is to be really uh, cognizant of the way you when you do have dollars in your pocket, how do you spend them? How do you save them? Right now, inflation and the war in Ukraine have lots of people thinking about how they spend their dollars on gas. In the U.S., prices at the pump these days are breaking records. They spiked to an average high of $4.33 a gallon as of March 11th. But there is indeed an app for that. GasBuddy uses GPS, combined with crowdsourcing, to compare costs at gas stations near you. 
Well, Gas Buddy was a website that essentially launched uh, some 22 years ago, back in the year 2000, in the dot-com era. It was founded by two guys who were uh, fascinated by the fact that gas prices varied so significantly station to station. Patrick DeHaan is head of petroleum analysis at Gas Buddy. They started a website, gasbuddy.com, that has grown into a service that tracks gas prices at 150,000 gas stations across the U.S. and Canada to help motorists find those lower prices. It has evolved into a, a, a platform. It was essentially one of the first crowdsourced websites before all the social networking came along. This was truly built uh, from volunteers. The ease of online searching has gotten all of us used to comparison shopping. It's very much a mindset, but I think it's one that is empowering instead of crippling. That is, motors can look at our app and they can decide, okay, it's not convenient for me. I don't want to go out of my way. But knowledge is power. But how much energy should we be putting into our thrifty ways? That's something Wall Street Journal reporter Lauren Weber says she began to question. At a certain point, could there be costs that come with being cheap? There is definitely a price we pay to be frugal. It takes a lot of strategizing, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of, you know, advanced thinking sometimes. You know, I can't tell you how much time I sometimes spend thinking, should I buy myself a sandwich or should I just wait until I get home and eat what's in my refrigerator? And I, I, I'm sure I spend like far more mental energy on that question that could be, you know, much better used in other ways. Not to mention when you're, you know, with your friends and you're out for dinner and, you know, like, you don't want to be the person who's like nickel and diming on the bill. I, I don't want to be that person, even though I'm extremely frugal with myself, but I really work hard not to, to be that way with other people and impose it on other people. So yeah, there's a lot of trade-offs. And as I get older, I see that some of them are really not worth it. I've definitely relaxed. I'm not proud of it, but I will say, by being so cheap earlier in my life, I, I started out, I have a nice nest egg for my retirement. So Charles, it makes a lot of sense to me that, you know, a lot of people don't get to be cheap by choice, right? Like their economic circumstances basically mean they have to hunt for bargains and try to pinch pennies everywhere they can. But some people don't have to do that. And they're just cheap by choice. And that could drive people kind of crazy. I could imagine some pretty significant costs being associated with you know, spending countless hours looking for every possible way to save money. Stephanie, you must be talking about the discussions in my household, I think. So, so yeah, I mean, look, I am an inveterate cheapskate and, and it can take a lot of time and a lot of effort. And some might argue a lot of wasted time and effort. Um, in fact, my wife has argued that. So one of the running arguments in our in our household, but it kind of has reached a fever pitch in recent months, is that I'm one of those people who employs various strategies to maximize points with my credit cards that I use. So I have one card I use, a base card for everyday uh, rewards, which is 2% back. I have a, a different card I use for restaurants, which gives me 3% back. I have a different card I use specifically for fast food restaurants, which gives me 5% back. I have cards for gas. I have cards for travel. And yes, when I see my wife, when I greatly get the credit card bill at the end of the month, and I notice that, you know, she used the restaurant card for a fast food purchase and not the fast food card, uh, this leads to all sorts of interesting conversations. So Stephanie, I've been also thinking about the fact, what happens if we have an entire society filled with people like me? I mean, if everybody goes cheap, what happens to our economy? Well, you know, the economy actually runs on sales. So if you think about what our GDP is, it's just the total dollar value of everything that's produced and sold every single year. So if a lot of us were running around trying to spend less and save more, pinching pennies actually robs the economy of demand. So every dollar that we save and don't spend back into the economy is a dollar that some business can't capture as part of its revenue and ultimately part of its profits. So when we close up our wallets and get very frugal, businesses are losing customers and they have less incentive to hold on to workers and expand production. So it can actually drag the economy down. 
The spend-save trends in American life tend to cycle in parallel with whatever is going on in our economy. But maybe global changes and changes in values might mean the new generation of cheapests out there isn't just chasing the latest shiny penny. Thanks for listening to the best new ideas in money. You can subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like the show, please leave us a review. As you probably know, it's the best way for other listeners to discover us. If you have ideas for future episodes or a question you'd like us to answer, drop us a line or send us a voicemail at bestnewideasinmoney at marketwatch.com. Thanks to Ronald Goldsmith, Lauren Weber, Brian Kelly, Claire Oliverson, and Patrick DeHaan. To learn more about Cheapism, head to marketwatch.com. I'm Stephanie Kelton. And I'm Charles Passy. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast from Market Watch, produced by Best Case Studios. Suzanne Myers is our producer. Our associate producer is Hannah Leibowitz Lockard. The executive producer for Best Case Studios is Adam Pincus. For Market Watch, Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer, and the associate producer is Katie Ferguson. Jeremy Binks is our news editor. This episode was mixed by Katie Ferguson. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. Stephanie Kelton is an economist and professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and not part of the Market Watch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea.